So thank you uh, very much for that um, very kind uh, introduction. Um, so on the, on the first slide, uh, it says that I direct the Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies at UCLA, which I do direct. It's a center that works on the LA region. Um, I also do research through the, the PSR and UCLA's Institute for Transportation Studies uh, as, as well. So uh, Jen just talked about how this was an experiment, and so my talk is going to be a little bit of an experiment as, as well. So I was asked to talk about not research, which I am always happy uh, to do, um, but this morning I'm going to be talking about uh, navigating uh, an academic career, and you'll get to... Um, get to hear a little bit about my own academic uh, career. And I actually found uh, this a useful exercise in terms of uh, preparation, because I got to, you know, what can you say in 20 minutes? So I got to really reflect on what the keys have been for, uh, for me. So I'm going to talk about uh, academic careers weighted heavily toward the front end um, which is what I'm assuming, you know, I looked at all of your bios, so I'm assuming PhD students sort of early in, in your career. And so that's what I'm going to be doing um, in 20 minutes or less, maybe. Okay, so I'm going to talk just for a minute. You probably have thought through this already because you've made decisions about being in an academic program, but I'm going to talk about what I see as some of the opportunities and challenges going to tell you a little bit about sort of me and sort of my motivation for uh, doing all of this so you could kind of think about my comments in the context in which I am making it is you know sort of through my own personal experience but also clearly uh, sort of uh, working with our own doctoral students at UCLA to successfully navigate their their careers as as well and then um, I'm going to talk about um, a few key lessons. Can't talk about everything, so I'm really just going to highlight uh, the things I think are, are most uh, sort of important. Um, if you know me uh, well, this is something that I always say, is I think that in, in general, in life, uh, strengths and weaknesses, strengths and challenges are related to each other, right? So, you know, the one side is a strength and the other side is a weakness. And I think that that's true in thinking about academic careers as, as well. So for me, you know, sort of why an academic career? Well, I think that it uh, is an opportunity to have multiple kinds of impact uh, on the world. So impact through your scholarship. Uh, if you, not all of you are, but many of you are in a professional field, so you have uh, an impact through some of the applied uh, sort of research that you do. You certainly have an impact training the next generation of professional leaders. Um, some of them are academics, some of them are uh, planners and engineers and, and, and whatnot. And then there are clearly opportunities to have an impact as you kind of move your way through academic administration uh, sort of as, as well. Uh, the cartoon, can you see the cartoon at the bottom? The cartoon relates to this point, right? This idea of uh, sort of flexibility, and it, it'll show up on the other side of my slide uh, as well. You know, so clearly one of the things that drew me was the opportunity to have such intellectual freedom, right? So, you know, clearly you got to move, got to get a job, you got to move, you know, to getting tenure and a permanent position. But this idea that you could have some kind of an idea and pursue it um, was really in, enticing, right? And then people talk about, you know, sort of the, the schedule as well, so highly, highly flexible. Um, opportunities to collaborate with a wonderful group of individuals, be they students and uh, you know other faculty, other professionals. Um, and what's not to like about a career where part of the career is that you learn new things all the time? Okay, I'm going to come back to this point in a minute. But wow, what a what a luxury! What a what a what a privilege! Um, so there's a flip side to the story, sort of clearly. Um, one of them, which I'm facing, you know, Jen talked about, yes, the UCs are uh, on break right now. And right after this, I'm going to go and 
grade papers, right? So there's no, there's no clear work boundaries. So it's, it's nice that you know, we're on break, but some of us are not on break, right? Some of us are here, including, uh, it starts early, right? Including some of the, the UC students. Um, I think this one is really key. I mean, I think that um, one of the challenges is that it really is self-directed, right? So, uh, you know, while there is this huge sort of luxury in terms of the flexibility about what you're working on, uh, you make it happen pretty much. Um, and so that requires a unique individual with unique skills to move that career uh, sort of forward. I think I'm going to come back to this point too, is that I am, um, I really like clear direction. I like rules. I'm a pretty rule-bound person. My kids tell me this as, as well. Um, and so I like to know, you know exactly what I need to do, and then I figure out a way to, to get there. I mean, that's just my personality. And unfortunately, that's not quite how this career is set up. And so even though, and I will come back to this, even though we have guidance in terms of uh, you know, promotion and every university does, right, has their sort of Bible for what you need to do to move forward in your career. Um, it's not a rule book. It's never quite as clear as at least, you know, sort of I would want it uh, uh, to be. Um, and then, you know, it is certainly, and I will come back to this as well, it is uh, a career where you're balancing sort of multiple, often unrelated types of responsibilities. And so um, that's very challenging. So I kind of crib this from multiple places, but it certainly, you know, sort of speaks uh, sort of true to, you know, how I think about my job. So, you know, research, teaching, and service. So this is how we, you know, when we write these letters for uh, promotion, we talk about our contributions in those three areas and you can see I'm not going to go through it in detail but you can see that you know it's not just research teaching and service under each of these categories are a whole set of things that you have to stay on top of as as part of your career right so here's the research bit you know, uh, you know, here's a list of responsibilities that are related to the teaching component, which is not just being in the classroom, right? Not just preparing your courses, not just curriculum development, but really thinking about mentoring and advising students and different kinds of students, right, for different kinds of careers. So <clears throat> I could even probably sort of expand this out another level as well in terms of responsibilities. Um, that's true for the third piece, right? So it's very exciting. I mentioned, you know, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I was interested in a, prof you know, in working in a professional degree in, in environment is that connection to practice, which I know Marty Wax is going to be talking about later in the program. Um, but there's a whole set of responsibilities related to service as well, both on your, in your department, right, on your campus, uh, and related to the profession in the community as, as well. So lots of different kinds of responsibilities all in one job. And so it, it takes a lot of thinking about how you're going to navigate uh, sort of through that. Um, let me just give you, I'll, I'll tell you my own motivation, and then I'm just gonna you know, kind of talk through what I think are the sort of keys to, to uh, sort of moving forward in uh, this career. Um, so I mentioned before, you know, I, I'm pretty excited about a career in lifelong learning. I think that it is a, a, a great uh, sort of luxury to be able to do that. And when uh, people ask me, you know, well, why did you decide to get your, you know, PhD? Well, after two years in an urban planning master's degree program, I really felt like I had just started uh, learning. Um, so part of my decision to continue and then to continue in terms of an academic career was to continue that, that, that process. Um, I also really like doing research, which is good because if you're in a doctoral program, the focus of the program is research, right? Um, so it's learning how to do research. And so um, before I filled out applications to get a PhD, I wanted to finish my master's thesis and be able to say, oh, 
I still really like doing this because, you know, after finishing the first piece of academic research, if I decided, you know, I, I was done with this kind of work, I didn't want to sign up for another four years of a, of a doctoral program. So as it turns out, which is a good thing, um, I really do enjoy uh, sort of doing research. Um, for me, I had a background before uh, sort of go getting my master's degree in urban planning. I did a lot of organizing in low-income communities, you know, around California, but also around the, around the country. And so my motivation to go down this sort of planning uh, sort of road um, was really this opportunity to sort of enhance my skills to have an impact on the world. I mean, that's the kind of the theme that ties together everything that I, I do. And so I saw that I could pursue that uh, in the context of a professional school that bridges sort of the academic and the, and the professional uh, worlds. And, and by the way, I'm not at all sorry about that decision. I'm very happy uh, with it. So the cartoon, I think, doesn't apply. Right, that was the purpose, right? So, you know, I'm a college professor, Jason. You need to ask someone else if you want advice about the real world. And I hope, you know, many of you here are uh, getting your degrees or teaching in a professional school environment. And I hope that this doesn't apply to you as well. You're really thinking about both sort of scholarly and academic questions, but their impact on the real world. And so you would have something uh, to tell, what's his name, Jason, okay? So. Um, and then, you know, one of the special parts certainly about, uh, about the, you know, work as an academic is the opportunity to, to work with so many wonderful people, um, both students uh, and other scholars, not only at your own institution. I mean, what's wonderful about a gathering like this one is that you get to meet your colleagues or your future colleagues, right? Um, and so that's truly terrific. Okay, so um, I just did some cutting and pasting here. There's a lot of, as it turns out, there's a lot of advice about how to navigate an academic career. And so I'm certain this is not a complete census of these books, right? But uh, there are a lot, there's a whole cottage industry. So it turns out if you don't like doing research after your doctoral program or whatever, you can, you know, you can participate in, in writing some of these books because there's a lot of them. Uh, sort of out there. And so again, I'm not going to be able, I don't know what's in these because i, I got to be honest, I haven't read them, but, um, but I'm not going to be able to cover everything. So I'm just going to highlight the things that seemed, uh, that uh, seem important uh, to me. And I'm going to do it um, by talking about three different phases quickly and just drawing five lessons around each of these, okay? Um, so I tried to pick the things that were most important. So one is to talk about graduate school. Um, the first part of navigating an academic career. The second is to talk briefly around, about uh, the job search. Um, and then the third is to talk just briefly about sort of navigating through the job itself as an, as an academic. And again, I'm going to highlight, I, just thought, I, I was assembling these slides and all of a sudden I thought, oh, there are five. So I thought, okay, I'm going to make this all parallel. Five, five, and five. So five lessons uh, for each of these, okay? So um, graduate school. So the one thing that I tell all of my doctoral students is that your life as an academic doesn't start with your first appointment. Oftentimes you think, okay, you know, I'm in this doctoral program and really life as an academic starts when I get that first job. And I really do not think that that is the case. That life as an academic, your career as an academic starts the first day that you step foot into a doctoral program. Because if you really think about the kinds of things that you do as a doctoral student, to be honest, you know, that list of responsibilities is pretty similar. Okay, but you're not taking classes, you're teaching them, okay? So other than that. But as you go along in the doctoral program, that list of responsibilities is very similar to what you're gonna do the first year you're an assistant professor somewhere, okay? So you really need to think about uh, sort of that. You know, certainly while you're in the program, you need to get sort of a well-rounded, sort of rigorous training. And so you want to think about, you know, oftentimes the students come in and say, I got to take, you know, every class you could possibly take at UCLA, so I'll be prepared to be an academic. That's not possible, okay? 
but you know you certainly take classes and exams I would say as much or even more it was probably more for me when I went through the doctoral program most of my learning in the program came from things I did outside of the classroom okay but you need to kind of think through that plan to make sure that it's well rounded and you're getting what you need out of the out of the program um, you want to finish in a reasonable amount of time and I'll tell you because early on in your career the one measurement like later you look at CVs and publications and impact factors and citation you know you look at all of that stuff later but early in the career one measure and I look at it when I'm asked to evaluate funding proposals I look at it when I uh, uh, sort of evaluate uh, you know lists of folks for awards for jobs and on is how long did it take them to get through the doctoral program if it takes them a long time to get through the doc doctoral program they're not going to be a successful academic right and so that's one bit of information that you have uh, especially early in your career okay so in order to do this you have to come to terms of the fact that you're not going to know everything by the time you graduate in fact you're not going to know everything by the time you're 20 years into your career okay um, so um, and that you have to manage your time strategically and this is a learned skill okay so that's part of what you're learning when you're in uh, the doctoral program um, I think this is probably not as much of an issue now as it was in previous years but you want to make sure you complete your dissertation before starting a new job I think now it's really hard to get a job before you've completed uh, uh, your dissert completed and filed your dissertation and then finally you want to have post dissertation research plans because that first year in an academic position is really tough right so you want to make sure you've kind of built in as part of your doctoral program that transition okay a few words about the job search um, so the first thing is to determine your professional priorities so you know one thing about being in or getting your degree in a professional school whether it be engineering or urban planning or other uh, professional schools is that you do have options right and so <clears throat> you can go down this academic track uh, you can go down a non-academic track and even within those you can think about the kinds of institutions so you know that academic track do you want to be at a, at a research university like USC or UCLA or Irvine or Davis do you want to be at a teaching university where you're primarily not that you're not doing research as well and at UCLA we certainly do teaching right but there are different kinds of institutions and you need to think about where you'd like to make your contribution and I'm not going to talk as much about this because I don't have as much experience uh, doing it um, but there's that non-academic track to think through uh, as well you want to be as flexible as you can right so if you decide that you only want to have an academic appointment in a city that touches a beach for example or a mountain for skiing or whatever your thing is you can have a harder time getting a job okay so you wanna you wanna make sure that you are flexible enough okay so location disciplinary home as well so my t PhD is in urban planning you know I do work on poverty and low-wage labor markets I had inter and gender so I had interviews in gender studies programs in labor studies programs in public policy programs and in planning right so um, so think about you know kind of your flexibility uh, as as well so uh, doctoral students always come to me and say well should I apply for this position or they do it with funding too should I apply for this should I apply for that and I, the the table of UCLA folks will know already what I say and the answer is yes okay so what you want to do is apply to any and all jobs that interest you right where you think you might have a possibility of being interested in that position and that clearly overlap it doesn't have to completely overlap but at least touches on your qualifications okay let them decide that you're not qualified okay or that they're interested in a different kind of person okay so maybe this fits with being as flexible as you can right so be as open as you possibly can 
I think we often think because we get anxious about you know the job search that the job search is all about the <laughs> the the university wherever you're applying saying okay are are you the job candidate good enough and I think that you really need to think about it as a matching process so you clearly need to nicely sell yourself your interests your accomplishments your strengths so you need to point those things out um, at the same time as you're going through these interviews, you also need to assess whether the job is a good fit for you, right? Are you going to be happy in this environment as well? So it really is uh, sort of a matching. So be active and ask questions, and right? So it is this matching process. And then this is probably the most important. So if you're applying for all you know, a whole bunch of things all the time, um, you just can't be discouraged. You're probably going to get more no's than yeses. I certainly did, OK? But you got to remember, it only takes one yes, right? You only need one job. You don't need 10 jobs, OK? You need one good fit for, for you. And so you have to, I hate being rejected. It's just a really lousy feel. Who likes being rejected, right? You know. Um, but you have to just, you know, just keep on putting yourself out there and good things will, will happen. And that is certainly true with the, the job search. And then the la my last five uh, have to do with academic, uh, should the job itself. And again, I'm going to kind of, my comments are weighted toward the beginning of uh, sort of an, an academic career. Um, so the first thing is about academic advancement. So you need to have a clear understanding of the academic advancement process and expectations for promotion. So I mentioned at the beginning, it is kind of fuzzy, but you need to have the information, I mean, whatever information is out there about the expectations and the process of that institution, you need to know what that is. And usually universities have special sessions to assist assistant professors in, in those expectations. So they know the first you know, day, week, or whatever that they step foot on the campus, they know what they're supposed to do, okay? Um, time management is key. I mean, I already talked about it as one of the challenges. Um, so given the expectations for your university and your position, and it will vary by university, it'll vary by whether you're at a primarily research university or a teaching university or whatnot, you need to manage your time accordingly. And so you need to maintain a laser beam focus on whatever these priorities are, okay? Um, and it's really, uh, it's extremely difficult, right? Because you have all those responsibilities that I put on that table, okay? And it is very, very easy to do whatever is in front of your face. I mean, I know it. I've been guilty of it. Someone comes and says, oh, there's a crisis here. You really need to act on it. But if you have a clear plan and priorities, right, then you can say, OK, where does this fit into my priorities? And then you'll be able to make decisions accordingly. It's really tough, OK, because you want to make nice in your departments or whatnot. So you have to be very nice about it and strategic. But you should be spending most of your time on the things that are going to move your, your career forward. Um, so, um, you know, this is related to the job search as well, is that you certainly ne need to maintain a positive attitude. So you need to keep on, you know, it's true for jobs, it's true for publications and funding, is that you need to kind of keep on putting yourself out there um, and not uh, be daunted by rejection, okay? I mean, we all get publications rejected or need to revise, okay? Um, funding is a good thing, okay? Um, so it allow you to support students, um, and that's great as part of your mentoring. Certainly allows you to enhance your research program. You need to invest in teaching um, and just recognize that the first year, no matter where you are, teaching takes a long time. All those preps take uh, sort of a long time, but it gets easier, right? So the second time you do it, it gets much easier. And then my final point, um, is that you should make sure that you don't go it alone. There's no reason for you to go it alone. There's opportunities for mentoring. There's training opportunities. Uh, and there's certainly lots of, uh, of colleagues that, and, uh, that can be collaborators and help you through this process. So even though oftentimes you're engaged in sort of independent scholarly work in order to get tenure, certainly at a, at a, at a uh, research university, um, there, there are support systems out there. Um, and you ought not to do it on your own. OK, that's it for me. Thanks, everybody.
I'm John Lauer. I'm a practitioner, so it's going to be uh, uh, kind of an interesting dynamic for you to see uh, your choices here. You uh, PhD students have a fork in the road coming up as you get your degree. Uh, great uh, to have academic careers. The practitioners rely so much on the research that comes out of that, and then we get to implement it. So that's uh, always been a fun part for me. Brief background, I uh, spent most of my career uh, with uh, uh, public agencies, City of Anaheim Traffic and Transportation Manager. But before that, I had an undergraduate degree in urban planning, and then I came to USC for a master's in public administration. With a master's in public administration, however, did I uh, wind up being a city traffic engineer? I'm still trying to figure out how that happened, but uh, it, it's been a great career. And it's my great pleasure to be here to moderate this session on transportation and technology. Technology is the key component, the critical component for the ongoing transformations in transportation. An electrified transportation network, a connected and automated transportation system with shared trips. That's all key to a, a place where we want to live and where we want to work and to have the ability as a practitioner to be a part of implementing that and operating that and maintaining that is an exciting future that I would uh, encourage you to give consideration to uh, uh, be it in, uh, working as a public agency or in the private sector and consulting. Those are great opportunities for a great career in, in those areas. So we've got an excellent uh, panel pulled together today. They are nearly ready once we get uh, Poyon connected, but uh, all well prepared and uh, uh, ready to engage with you, the audience, to think through their research and how it can be applied to improve society. So as Poyon gets ready, let me introduce him. Uh, Poyon is a PhD candidate here at USC. He uh, has research focus on adaptive traffic signal control, changing uh, traffic signal green time allocation every signal cycle to move more vehicles, more trips through the system safely and with less impacts to the environment. So I'm uh, also pleased to, uh, to say that uh, upon his graduation, come this May, he's going to come back to work at ITERIS. Uh, I am with, uh, with ITERIS, uh, uh, Intelligent Transportation Systems firm, headquartered in Orange County. So uh, we're looking forward to having uh, Puyang come back to, to work with us. Uh, uh, I, I also want to uh, note, as Puyang is uh, struggling with technology. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good thing, right? <laughs> uh, come this June, uh, the Intelligent Transportation Society of America will have their annual meeting. And the theme of that is making our transportation system safer, and greener. So uh, that's going to be in Washington, D.C. this June, and it sets the table for next year, the real exciting announcement that in October of 2020, the Intelligent Transportation Society World Congress is coming to Los Angeles at the Los Angeles Convention Center, October 4 through 8, 2020. Uh, the World Congress rotates uh, from uh, Asia well, from Europe to Asia to the Americas. So every third year, it's in the Americas and Los Angeles getting to host 10,000 international visitors to come and think through the, the uh, intelligent transportation opportunities here. We're doing now preliminary work on the uh, uh, technical tours that uh, the delegates will have an opportunity to go on. And we're about to send out a call for demonstrations of the intelligent transportation system technologies. So uh, Puyan, just uh, as you fire up here, let me ask you, what uh, was your undergraduate degree in and how did you wind up with uh, your current research? Yes, yeah, so my undergrad was, <coughs> excuse me, my undergrad was actually in civil engineering. I did it back in Iran at the University of Tehran. 
and then I applied for a PhD program in civil engineering at USC where I've been working on where it's mostly like interdisciplinary between electrical engineering and civil engineering where we use as you said control and optimization techniques to improve the traffic performance mostly on arterial network. I'm going to give you an overview of part of the research that I've done for my PhD thesis. So as you all know, so let me give you a little bit of motivation. We all have been living in Southern California. We all have experienced this kind of scene, I bet. My favorite one is actually 405, because no matter which it's weekdays or weekends or what time of day you're driving it up or north, you're going to see this kind of congestion. Recent surveys have shown that actually an, an American employee, on average, spend about 2,400 hours of their lives <laughs> Waiting the traffic, which is about four months of your life. It's a big number. On the other side, we have this rapid advancement in traffic sensing technologies, like traffic cameras, traffic sensors, that gives you the, the ability to get real-time information. And you can't think of smart uh, cities without having a smart intersection or a smart traffic lights, obviously. So there is this opportunity to use the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, vehicle-to-infrastructure, or infrastructure-to-infrastructure -infrastructure communication to use the most of the capacity of the network and make it more efficient. So that's where exactly my research comes into place, where I'm interested in <coughs> using the real-time information and in in terms of control and optimization perspective, there are so many things that you can tweak in order to make your traffic smoother and improve the safety and mobility of the system. For example, you can play with the traffic signal controllers, you can play with the ramp meters, or you can program the vehicles to communicate into each other to smooth the traffic flow or control the speed limit, things like that. So that's a big picture of my research. and so. The main two part of the, my research is first analysis and then control. Because prior to doing control, we want to know what's going on in place right now. What is the existing condition? So I'm, what I'm interested in is developing some performance evaluation tools or signal performance measure in order to see how's the current controller, most fixed time controller, how do they work, and then we switch gear to control side where I'm interested in optimizing certain network performance metrics. For example, you can optimize network throughput, you can optimize travel time or fuel consumption, and see how you can make things better in uh, transportation network. And my focus is mostly on arterial network. So we're going to see about it. So to just to give you a quick background about traffic control, so what's the main two Algorithms, <coughs> sorry, or controllers that we have, one of them is fixed time, which most of you have seen probably. More than 90% of intersections in the United States are operating under fixed time, where the signal timing plan, as it sounds, it's fixed. Or most of the case, it's pre-time based on time of the day. So meaning the parameters of the traffic signals are not changing based on real-time information or not. So they're fixed. For example, the green elevation, they're usually tuned based on some offline collected data that they update every few years and they let it run and then based on the complaints that they get from the people they try to tune it and update the other the other more recent one and more advanced one is the adaptive or feedback controllers where in real time you can adjust the green allocation the offset or cycle length or parameters of the traffic signal controllers based on the measurements or the detections that you have from sensors and cameras. So the first part of my talk is mostly about how we can how we can evaluate the performance of fixed time. And the second part, I'm going to give a, a description of a specific type of controllers called proportionally fair control. So this is the outline of talk, as I explained already. So let's talk about just a quick overview of intersection control for those of you who are not familiar. So when you have an intersection, you have some network parameters. You have an external demand, which is nothing but the flow that is coming to your intersection from different legs of the intersection. 
Then you have turning ratios, which basically tells you how many of vehicles are going to make a right or make a true movement or make a left turn. Those are the things that they're usually, well, even right now, sometimes they do it by just counting. Someone will stand there at the intersection and they put a counter, how many people are making right, left. Believe it or not, it's still pretty traditional. But there are algorithms how to extract these uh, parameters. The other parameters that you have, so one of them is the capacity function, which tells you what is the capacity of the intersection, meaning if you give it green time, what is the flow that it can push out of the link. And then on top of that, you have the parameters of the traffic signal controllers, which are, for example, the cycle length, the phasing, the green time, the offset. So cycle length is basically the period that you have to give service to multiple links, and you have to smartly distribute it among all the incoming links so that you have a efficient uh, traffic flow. S having that said, so I want to, as I said, I want to give some performance analysis. So let's think of the traffic model as a box, given the set of parameters that I explained. Let's say the green time, a traffic signal timing plan is given to you, and you know the geometry and the architecture of the network. But prior to implementing that in the field, you want to know that if it's going to work well. So for that, you need a model. You need a traffic model. As I said, for fixed time, it could be fixed time or it could be feedback control where your parameters are being updated based on your real time, for example, measurement of the Q length. So what I'm interested in is how is it performing? For example, what is the Q length? What is the travel time from point A to point B under the signal timing plan? or what is the fuel consumption. So what I'm interested in is basically quantifying the congestion. I want to see under this given signal controller, how's the congestion in the network. So in order to do that, one major uh, model that usually it's being used is the microscopic model, is what usually is common as the simulation. So you do traffic micro simulation, and then you analyze how the network work on their certain perform, uh, signal control. So you have to model each of the uh, roadways that you have with a certain number of lanes, with the exact lane geometry, all the curves and everything. And then you program the signal timings. So what I've done here is that I've got the signal timing plans from LADOT. And I've got the volume from our collaborator from the uh, loop detector sensor. So this is trying to create a PM uh, PM peak uh, under the existing controller. So what? this is one way of doing that. This is one way of quantifying what is the congestion look like. But the other way, so this, as you can tell, it's very intense and detailed, meaning, first of all, you have to, you have to buy a license for that. Usually, these are pretty expensive. Even if you want to get a mixed version, it's a couple of thousand dollars. And then you have to be trained in order to use them. It usually takes time to learn how to model and code the network in those kind of softwares. And then the simulation time, usually you have to let them run for multiple runs overnight for a couple of days to get the results. And on top of that, the scalability. For example, if you have a network with four intersections, you want to go for a network with 40 intersections, it's not like you can easily scale that. You have to sit down and create and code the network. What I'm interested in is giving a simple macroscopic model that you can easily implement in open source like um, softwares or coding platforms like MATLAB or Python. But I'm trying to show that using that kind of simple model, you're still able to get a accurate result about the congestion and coolant. So that's the idea behind this. So I have to obviously understand the dynamic of the network in order to be able to model it realistically. So how do I model it? I go after it using a differential equation. Why? Because traffic has dynamics, right? So the Q length on each link is changing. It's not static, obviously. So what is the ch so let's think of the Q length on each link as let's uh, have it show it with x. Then the change in x is basically the number of vehicles that have arrived and the number of vehicles that have departed from that link. So it's basal basic uh, conservation of mass is inflow minus outflow. If you notice, the inflow is quite simple because in the 
current setup, usually the demand is considered to be constant. So we have the demand term and we have the turn ratios, which are usually constant. But the challenge is how to model the outflow, because that's the unknown part of this model. And what, so the one important thing about the outflow is that it has to have this on and off behavior. It has to capture this on and off behavior. Obviously, outflow is, is related to the capacity function. So when it's given green, it's going to have, you're going to have an outflow from the link. And when it's given red, you're, not, you're going to have zero vehicles coming out of the links. But there are more complicated issues regarding that that you have to also, the main thing is that the outflow of a link also depends on the queue length of that link. Because if you're giving green to a link and there is no vehicle on that, then the outflow would be zero. So the, ch the challenge is how to capture that. And what people have been doing is usually they use a, because of this discontinuity, it's usually difficult to model the outflow. But what they do is that they just approximate the outflow with the average constant capacity. So they, they forget about these on and off pulses, and they use a continuous linear uh, approximation. But the problem with that is that when you run that kind of model in MATLAB, you get a, the steady state Q that you get is constant. It's not, a relevant, it's not very relevant or representative of the actual Q length. Because when you m model the Q length in traffic simulator, well, the one that I showed right now, the micro simulation, you are indeed able to see this on and off behavior, meaning the queue will build up when the link is given red. And then when it's given green, it's going to die down. So we want a model, a realistic model, has to capture this in order to be able to have accurate results in terms of queue length. So what we do is that we propose a linear programming or an optimization problem to calculate this outflow term z here. And uh, the unique thing about it is that we actually prove theoretically and analytically that it has a unique solution. Meaning, for example, if you model this network in MATLAB or in Python, it's, gonna, it's not going to crash. It's going to give you the answer no matter what, as long as your demand is within the feasible region. It turns out that it, it's quite matching with the microscopic simulation I showed earlier. So this is a case study that I did on a 16 intersection in downtown LA. Here we are showing the comparison between my macroscopic model and the simulation that I showed earlier. So the blue, the blue lines here is the average Q length with the error bar from this microscopic simulation for two specific links. And the red one is the output of my MATLAB simulation, which is the macroscopic model, the big level model that I showed you. So you can see that it, uh, it's actually matching. So so we have a theory that it converged to a steady state Q length. And on top of that, the Q length that we capture is, in fact, matching with the one from the complex micro simulation model. So that's, that's a very nice result, uh, I believe. And then on top of that, there is more to it. So now that we are in MATLAB or in micro simulation, we want to see that, because as I said, for for the simulation, you usually have to let the simulation run to get to the steady state. It's usually time consuming. But what we are interested in is that is there any way to direct that steady state Q length directly, to calculate it directly without having to go through the transient or waiting for the long run simulations. So in fact, several researchers have shown that if your demand and capacity satisfy certain assumption with a T periodic, like let's say if your cycle length is T periodic, you're going to achieve a Q length that is T periodic, meaning every uh, T second your Q length will, rep will be repeated. So what we are doing right now, what I'm interested in is that I actually come up with a nice neat search algorithm to directly calculate the steady state Q length without having to go through the transient. So you give me the capacity of the network and the uh, demand of the network. And then we use this nice search algorithm to give you the, the, the steady state Q length without even running extensive simulation. So the idea behind it, if I want to explain quickly, is that you basically need to know one point on this trajectory of Q length. This blue line is the trajectory of Q length. So if you have one point on the trajectory, then you can just simulate one cycle rather than simulating hundreds of cycles and get the entire trajectory. So it turns out that we are actually interested in the points that the Q length leaves zero, meaning it transitions from being zero to becoming positive. 
And it turns out that you can find these points based on the difference between the demand and the capacity. And then we give a nice search algorithm how to find such candidate points. And then we simulate one cycle and we give you the steady state Q-length. So that's about the analysis part. Now let's switch gear to the control. So in the control section, what I'm talking about is that I'm trying to Let's say I'm saying I want to design a controller such that for a given network, I want to optimize certain performance metric. For example, I want to optimize the network capacity. I want to make sure that I'm using the maximum network capacity. So what is network capacity? Network capacity or throughput is usually defined as the set of demand or arrival rates under which your network will not have any gridlock, meaning the traffic can move smoothly. There will not be any gridlock. So the way that you define the network capacity. So network capacity depends on the physical constraint of the network, obviously, the number of lanes, the number of movements that you have. On top of that, you also have the traffic controller. Because the traffic controller, if it's not too efficient, then it's going to waste some part of your capacity. So on top of that, the traffic controller also is very important. So what we are interested in is a specific type of controller called proportionally fair that has been shown that it has a nice performance in internet communication network. And we are trying to adopt that to a transportation network when the dynamic is different in some sense. So on top of showing theoretical result that it's stabilizing for the network, we also do case studies in terms of simulation. The good thing about this controller is that so it only needs the real-time measurement of Q-length. It's very minimal. It doesn't require the network demand. It doesn't require the capacity. It doesn't require knowledge of turning ratios. It's only the real-time Q-length. And it turns out that it's actually maximizing in terms of throughput. On top of that, we are also interested in other performance measures. For example, we also care about average delay or number of stop and things like that. Also, we show the improvement. You at least have around 20% improvement in terms of average delay and number of stops in nominal condition. And this is how we basically implement these kind of controllers in PTV Vsim, which requires coding it in C++ and MATLAB in order to upgrade the green time every 90 seconds. I guess with that, I'm going to conclude it. And I'm open to the questions. Thank you. So next up, we have Anthony Lopez, who is uh, an electrical engineering and computer science PhD graduate student researcher at uh, UC Irvine. And as he gets ready, Anthony, I want to ask you the same questions. What was your undergraduate degree, and how did you wind up uh, doing this research? So, um, so my undergraduate degree was in uh, computer engineering at uh, UC San Diego uh, from 2011 to 2015. And how I ended up into this research, good question because, you know, computer engineering, now I'm kind of doing civil engineering stuff, um, is, well, I studied network security uh, research. Uh, I did some research in that in undergrad. And then um, when I s entered PhD, I studied um, connected vehicle security, so wireless communication security. And then from there, I got into this whole intelligent transportation system uh, area. and thought, okay, well, why don't I go here? This is where things are going, you know, like, what can I do? What can I contribute? And I started working with a professor from uh, the Institute of Transportation Studies, ITS at UCI. His name is uh, Professor Wen Long Jin. And yeah, so now that's kind of what I'll talk about today. Good deal. <laughs> All right, the next 20 minutes are yours. Thank you. Let's hope it's, oh yeah, I'll keep it under 20. <laughs> so um, just want to say that this is still definitely a work in progress. Um, I will try to keep it as brief as possible. There is a lot of math, unfortunately. Um, but thankfully, the previous speaker actually covered a lot of similar material, so it's awesome. So again, I'll introduce myself. My name is Anthony Lopez. Um, my PI is um, Dr. Mohammed al farouk and I worked with, on this project with Professor De, uh, Wenlong Jin. Um, the title is Security Analysis for Current and Emerging Traffic Control Systems. Um, I mostly focus on fixed time control in this project, but eventually I want to work on the intelligent traffic control systems. Oh, I forgot there's other stuff. So here's the kind of outline of my talk. I'll go through an introduction, then go over the modeling part, and then go through attack modeling. So it's a security analysis in terms of uh, you have an attack model, you want to see the impacts of the attack models on your system. So here's kind of a nice slide 
uh, telling us what we already know, you know, automated um, vehicles and connected vehicles and uh, intelligent transportation system, traffic control, this is the new era, right? So this is always what a, a slide that I have in my uh, presentations. It's the motivation. A lot of people not in this area really like this slide because they don't know that this is happening, actually. So, and I present a lot to people not in transportation. So, but there are a lot of challenges, right? So uh, one of which is security. So you know, there's some questions like this. So what if the data is malicious? You know? what, what's going to happen? Um, what happens if a controller is completely taken over? You know? Uh, what if the sensor data is spoofed, meaning the sensor data is also faked, or somehow there was some uh, physical attack to it? So these kinds of the questions uh, we want to answer, and especially for uh, the worst case scenarios we want to prepare for, right? Uh, not only that, but now we're talking about all this wireless communication capabilities um, on top of the traditional fixed time uh, traffic control systems and this transitional era where we're adding all this technology. Um, yeah, it's great, but as we all know, with great power comes great responsibility, right? So uh, it's important to consider that, and um, unfortunately, there has already been a lot of vulnerabilities in these fixed-time traffic control systems with wireless capabilities um, uh, that have been discovered. And these traffic controllers have been implemented in all across the United States and many different countries. So the response by the agency after that vulnerability was found, by the way, this this vulnerability can be exploited so that the controller can be completely like uh, manipulated. So this is a serious thing, and the agency just kind of dismissed it. So uh, you can see that there's a big challenge in terms of security aspect too, that they're not really taking it seriously. So, um, and I understand that it's, a, it's uh, definitely tricky to, uh, uh, to consider security when you're developing these new technologies, for sure. So what we need, what I consider is, design time tools and runtime tools. And so that's kind of what I want to get into with this presentation. And it's just tip, you know, the tip of the iceberg. This, this, it's a very challenging problem um, modeling these systems, so, as we'll see. So here's like the threat model. So uh, as kind of the previous speaker discussed, you know, it's really easy, really easy to kind of understand what the traffic state is. You can, you can use your you can use your phone, you can, easy. But, not only that, if you can actually uh, breach the wireless network, you can also use the sensors that are already used in that uh, traffic control uh, system for like an intersection and use those sensor data for your uh, state estimation. And I'll explain why that's useful for an attacker later. They can obtain the access by, um, they can also, so they attain, attain access to the wireless network, then they can modify the uh, parameters of the, the, the timing plan, such as the phase, the, the green times, you know, all this stuff that we talked, uh, uh, we discussed in the previous presentation. So unfortunately, yeah, there are, not unfortunately, I mean, good thing is that there are hardware fail-safes. So you cannot do like a red-red kind of uh, signal um, uh, uh, configuration because the hardware itself prevents that. But you can manipulate the green times and the green time ratios and the cycle times within the certain range that's allowed, right? So what's an interesting question is, what would be an optimal attack for an attacker if they knew the traffic state? And that's kind of what I get into in this presentation. And from that, eventually I want to figure out what can we do to prevent an attacker from being able to do this kind of stuff and make the system resilient to such attacks, right? So here's the system model. It's very um, complex. So anyways, the idea is that in this model, oh, there's a title, is um, that we can have this kind of Manhattan grid network, which is all one-way homogeneous symmetric. So I consider these kinds of uh, networks first, but any other general network can be converted eventually. This can actually be abstracted as a single, uh, as a double ring road network. So, uh, and also just a one-way intersection. So the idea is that, uh, as we discussed before, there's like the turning ratio, the retain retaining ratio is the opposite of the turning ratio. It's one minus the turning ratio is the retaining ratio. Um, then uh, what, what we have seen in research and um, empirical evidence is that uh, the state of a system of a traffic network, such as the, this one right here, will reach a steady state, a stationary state over time. And um, therefore, we can use this kind of a double ring road network, which means that the uh, density, the average density, is, sta is steady. It's just constant. Um, and what we can do with two rings now is that we can actually m uh, model the behaviors of turning, which is important because if we don't have turning, it's less realistic. And be previously, they have had single ro uh, ring road network models, um, and they have shown that it's very good in, um, 
in modeling these inter networks, uh, uh, but you need to have this turning rate ratio uh, imported. So that's why this model is very useful. Um, so we have two rings, and each ring will have their density over time, but the average density k will always remain the same. So I will try to keep these things brief because there are a lot of slides. Um, there's a lot of equations, uh, but actually, he covered a lot of this stuff, thankfully. <laughs> so there's demand supply and the influxes and outfluxes, which all just model the behaviors of the, um, the cars going into the intersection, uh, crossing, and then going into different ways. So um, I'm not going to go too much into detail. If you want to ask me questions about it later, definitely. I'm more than up to, to answer. Uh, what we do need to know, though, is some of these parameters. So here we can see on the bottom, there's like pi j, which is the effective green time ratio of phase j. So there's only two phases, uh, by the way. And in two phases, um, the first phase, let's say, well, I didn't really talk about it before, but let's say uh, from east to west, let's say this one can be ring one, modeled as ring one, and north to south can be, or south to north can be modeled as the ring two. So an entire intersection, it'll be like that too. All the east to west can be modeled as ring one, and then all the uh, cars going south to north will be ring two, if, th if that makes sense, I hope. <laughs> so. Um, there's an effective green time ratio for each phase, and in the first phase, only cars from east to west, or west to east, will be going. And then in the second phase, only cars from south to north will be going. So basically, uh, that's how this, uh, this uh, works. Um, and so, here's the dynamics equation, which is... Uh, uh, which we can model as what's called a switch-defined system based on these two phases, um, the second equation. What's important here in the, the switch-defined system is are the coefficients, AM and BM, which we can use to determine uh, whether a state is potentially stationary or not. And why is this useful, you might ask? Well, we found out in the previous presentation these stationary states are um, good in the sense that we can just use a mapping based on them to figure out the performance, the, the, the current performance metric. It's a lot less uh, burden overhead on uh, uh, for the designers, uh, for the, uh, yeah, et cetera. So that's what we're really interested in here. So we use uh, the notation for a state as this, k1, t, and k, and it turns out that multiple values of these k1, T and K will have the same kind of traffic dynamic behavior. And what we can say is we can call them a density evolution region. And now let's, let's, let's show a visual so you can understand this be better. So these, these are like the regions per each phase. The left one is for phase one. The second one is for phase two. So these uh, one, two, three, four are different regions such that all the states in each of these regions will have the same uh, dynamic behavior. Um, the state will go horizontally, so uh, I'll explain this graph, by the way, on the bottom axis is k1 only, and uh, the, t uh, the vertical axis is k. Uh, the reason why we don't have k2 is because with just these two, you can understand what k2 is. You can just compute k2. So, and so you can see that this is kind of like the evolution of the density in k1 over an entire cycle, if that makes sense. So you start off, um, in, in the first one right there, you see, and then um, you go to the left because cars are going um, so, um, to the other ring. So that's why there's a drop in K1. And then now you look on this side, then cars in, K, in the ring one will be increasing because cars from the other ring will be going into the first ring, if that makes sense. This is based on the two phases. I'll explain more uh, after if you have questions. Anyways. Now we can use those coefficients to kind of figure out what are potentially uh, stationary states. Um, and we can use what's called point car care maps, which is kind of like down there you can see. It turns out if, um, he also explained it actually, uh, if a state uh, repeats uh, after a cycle, we can consider that as a potentially fixed state or a stationary state, which is useful because then we can pr uh, predict kind of the performance of that state uh, based on the signal settings. Um, and it's a lot less burdensome to compute, as it can be seen on that bottom left equation, which I'll not go into detail. So yeah, so here's uh, how we kind of will do the stationary state stability analysis. And we have some properties on the stability, um, which we will combine into this. 
macroscopic fundal diagram, which is something that almost every transportation engineer should know. Uh, this mapping between the density, and here is the average density of the, of the two rings, uh, and the combination of the signal settings, um, the retaining ratios, and the most important thing, which is Q, which is the average uh, uh, asymptotic traffic, uh, uh, traffic flow. And this is kind of the performance metric. So basically, the higher that is, there's always a cap, which is the capacity. But the higher that is, the better your, your, um, your control is doing. That's the idea. So we want, what I kind of envision is this. And this is kind of to answer the question later, which will be asked, is uh, why is this kind of research useful for um, like, um, the industry? Um, and for the um, public side, or well, there are agencies, right? So the agencies can be using these design time tools, which I can develop based on this, uh, so that they can uh, prevent unforeseen, uh, uh, well, prevent, um, unforeseen uh, situations and make the system resilient as well. So this is the uh, flow, flow, of the flow diagram of that. So I'll go on, uh, lightly into the attack modeling. So there's two primary uh, impacts which I consider in the attack model. Uh, one thing which no one probably knows or like ever has heard about because I kind of made it up is uh, not, not out of nowhere, but it's, uh, it's called convergence time impact. And what that means is that um, some states are called asymptotic stationary states, and that means that the system will eventually go to that state over time. That's why they're asymptotic. One of these kinds of states is the gridlock state. And I'll go to a previous graph right here. A gridlock state is the right here, these kind of things. So it's completely zero. The, the flow is completely zero. And that is no bueno in the eyes of a traffic engineer. So. If, you can, if the attacker can somehow detect the state and determine that it's in a gridlock state, and then, or asymptotic gridlock state, and then change the, the settings, they can actually make it converge faster to the gridlock, right? You don't want that. So anyways, and the other one is the average flow impact. So we know the average flow, which is Q. Um, and what I mean by this is, well, there will be an inherent drop based on, because of the attack. That's the idea. So I will show some uh, visualizations of these attacks. So over there on the left one is kind of what I was talking about. There's an asymptotic limit, and it converges faster. That's the idea, after the attack. On the right side is uh, what's called a, the state changing attack. And that means that the, the, the stationary state is not changed, or is changed. Um, and this will lead to the uh, drop in flow, especially. Um, on the left side, uh, the, the, the asymptotic flow drop, um, the asymptotic flow is not changed. That's the big difference here. So I'll show some visualizations or some graphs of some simulation. Uh, this is in a MATLAB uh, using the uh, point care maps. Uh, so just using the point care maps, you can, sit, you can kind of simulate what will be the density behavior over time. Um, and you can see that under, uh, this is just a hypothetical, by the way. I'm not sure if it's realistic such that the green time ratios will be equal. At, they'll be 0.3. But it's just to show that if you increase the green time ratios uh, such that they're both uh, 0.5, and that delta means that it's the attacked um, uh, value of that uh, parameter. And so you can see basically the change is, let's say this one is no attack. And then the top two is with the tax. So that means it converges like around here rather than way over here. That's kind of the idea. So it's a, a 1.53 convergence speed up is the idea. So that means that you have seven cycles less to react to an attack, kind of like, or a gridlock happening. So that's the idea here. And uh, for this one, um, is just to show the, uh, the, the, the evolution of the flow uh, with the attack. Then the state changing is uh, visualization is this. So let's say you're in a state that's uh, uh, right there. It's it's beautiful. You have the per like the maximum flow, but then the settings are changed in a way that you can cause that flow to go completely to gridlock, and that um, is kind of the idea for this attack. Of course, it's not that simple, but <laughs> here's a visualization of that attack in a simulation. Oh, so on the both these sides, I'll not go into too much detail, but the idea is that just with five cycles of change settings, you can cause as much as that big drop down here. So this is with attack, and this is without attack. So you just, by five, setting, uh, five cycles of, of changing the parameters to these, uh, well, this one, you can cause this big of a drop. So almost zero, and it's just five cycles. So clearly, um, it's a big impact. And I've simulated over many states and showed 
different kinds of uh, drops of the flows. Um, and I think I'm running out of time, so I'll answer more questions later. Uh, but yeah, so the idea, main idea, is that just from a few cycles of attacking, you can cause a pretty significant impact and damage to the flow, the performance. Um, and that should not be taken lightly, in my opinion. Uh, and we should really work on kind of designing resilient systems. Um, so the reason why also I use this model is that it's lightweight compared to the other models. We talked about macroscopic and micro. This one's considered a macroscopic. Um, in terms of the future, such as connected vehicles and, and all that, we can actually model those as well with this network, the, road, the double ring road network, um, because there's the turning ratios. And turning uh, is directly related to route guidance, as well as the um, guidance by the uh, traffic controllers. Um, and also, um, I plan on applying this, uh, these attack models to applications such as uh, speed limit advisory um, and uh, to determine the effects of uh, these uh, uh, kinds of attacks on that. Um, and definitely to um, also verify my results with uh, different models, such as uh, different tools, such as VISM, and eventually even combine my model or my tool with other um, platforms such as VISM RTI. I don't think any of you know it. It's a European one. Um, uh, so that people have the opportunity to use different tools to, to kind of uh, uh, view how their control signal timing uh, uh, plans are. And I want them to be able to use mine as well. So that, with that, I'll conclude. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Monica Ramirez Ibarra, Transportation Systems Engineering PhD student at University of California at Irvine. She's going to present on traffic implications of deploying self-driving trucks. So your uh, undergraduate was in what? Uh, civil engineering as well. Uh, yeah, so I came to UC Irvine almost three years ago uh, for a dual master's in urban regional planning and transportation systems engineering. And uh, that's one of my classes for the Irvine planning class. I found this paper on microscopic simulation. And I like how it was a transportation paper that incorporated engineering. So it was right up my alley or interests and so I contacted the second author who, was, who is now my advisor, Professor John Dynan Saforis, and that's how I kind of also started on my topic right now. Did you ever drive a truck? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I worked in construction before, oh, very so good. I got to drive um, a mixer, of like <laughs> asphalt mixer. Where do you think you're going, academic research career or a practitioner? I, I'm interested in Probably uh, private or uh, public agency. That's kind of my plans. OK, well, let's see <laughs> your research. Thank you. This study looks at the impact of introducing a level of autonomous vehicles to uh, freight operations. So uh, for this, I use microscopic simulation, as I mentioned. A brief outline for this presentation, I'll start by providing a, a background, including motivation and purpose for the study. Um, data sources, modeling framework, some of the key findings. And for this, I'd like to mention that these are still, it's still work in progress. So this is uh, some of the key traffic performance results. In the long run, I'd like to take this uh, to emission modeling and hopefully environmental justice assessments. And so these are our conclusions for the initial stage of the study. Well, the impact of autonomous vehicles on passenger transport has already received much attention. When uh, we start, started looking into this, uh, we found that truck platooning uh, specifically, which is one of the main aspects of this, are, were not as extensive. Um, even when we have prototypes ready to go, such as the Tesla Semi or Nikola One, which can provide not only autonomy, but also zero emissions. And so despite their expected benefits, we know that uh, so the public still has reservations about the deployment of autonomous vehicles, especially under mixed traffic conditions. And for this, I'll just let mention one study that I read back in 2017. It was um, 
uh, conducted by the PW Research Center, and they found that 65% of Americans will feel unsafe sharing the roof with an autonomous truck in particular, and 83% of Americans will prefer to have them on dedicated lanes, which is ex very expensive to do because you will need dedicated access points on a freeway to avoid disruption of traffic. And, and so with that, the, we also expect uh, autonomous trucks that by traveling in platoons, they increase road capacity, which has important implications for our infrastructure. And lastly, you'll find that the scenarios that I present today largely focus on the 710. And this is, as I'm sure we all know here, uh, the 710 has been a source of conflict over the years over how to expand it, modernize it, and clean it up. And so I rely heavily on the environmental documents that were released by Caltrans and LA Metro to build the scenarios and modify them as I go. So our study area extends between the San Pedro Bay ports and downtown LA. My freeway network includes 314 miles of freeways and 281 miles of arterials. Uh, the primary objective of this stage of the study is to quantify traffic improvements associated with the deployment of autonomous vehicle. And with that, I ho we hope to assess uh, the need for additional infrastructure. Now, um, building a network this large is an extremely time consuming process, as I'm sure my panel would agree with me. Uh, and so when I started, I had the opportunity to start working on a network that was, has been passed on at the at ITS. And so this includes the work of at least three students before me. And so every time we get it, we of course try to improve the network itself, but also the calibration of the driver behavior models. And as part of this, also I'm working on a new version to calibrate new demand. But for this, we had OD demand available. And I briefly explained what, how it was generated. So we basically got uh, OD demand for the SCAG region based on their 2030 planning model and a TransCAD network, which is a micro microscopic uh, network. And so we use this to conduct a severity analysis. From this, we got OD pairs for five time periods of our smaller study area. And these were used to apply a dynamic traffic assignment. And we use PEMS data to calibrate flows on freeways and AADT data for arterials. And so the output of this are 96 time periods corresponding to 24 hours of traffic. Now, um, so this area was calibrated for a representative day in 2005, which was March 9. They, the representative day is selected as a day with uh, relatively normal traffic conditions without major accidents or holidays or things like that. So the so first thing, uh, kind of a brute force method to start working on this was to compare uh, this March 9, 2005 to March 9, 2012. And so we looked at annual average daily traffic and found a 2% decrease in traffic flows. And we also look at the fleet distribution for Los Angeles County and saw differences between 0.01 and 6%. So for our purposes at this stage, we decided, okay, our OD demand can adequately represent uh, 2012 traffic conditions. Uh, and so we adjusted our demand based on some assumptions that I'll, I'll explain to represent what our future scenarios will look like. Now, um, Transmodeler 5.0, which is the package I use, uh, allows us to simulate connected vehicles by the implementation of a constant time gap car following model. And so this, what this does is uh, a comparative adaptive cruise control operation. Uh, under this operation, longitudinal control of vehicle motions are autonomous. And so the first challenge at this stage was to come up with reasonable headways to simulate. And so we couldn't find many sources that specifically define this headway for truck platooning. And 
one of the papers that we found was this 2015 white paper published by TNO, a Netherlands organization, and they define a uh, headway between two or more trucks to be between 0.3 and one second. This range is not too different from the 0.5 to one second that's usually used for many passenger vehicles. And so um, this is a constant time gap model that's built into Transmodeler, which uses the, the sire time headway age as a critical parameter. And so we tested the sensitivity of our results to variations to this headway between 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and one second. So this uh, car following model, we have the possibility of restricting its use only when the leading vehicle is also an autonomous vehicle, or in this case, a vehicle of the same class and category. And so what this translates into is that a platina vehicle, it's form at the lane level, and at the lane level, uh, acceleration is automated. We still have a driver in the wheel, so it's all steering movements are still in control, and so we have a driver aware of its surroundings at all time. Um, so for this scenario, our biggest assumption is this, based on the recirculated draft environmental impact report, which forecasts a growth in 20-foot equivalent units from 14.1 million to 41.1 million by 2035. This document also assumed that 35% of this cargo will be moved by rail. Now, based on observation of a truck activity monitoring system, we saw that the majority of trucks in our study area are 40-foot container trucks. So what this translates into is an approximately 90% increase in drayage trucks on the freeway network. With that, we come to the six scenarios that are presented today. Scenario one is just our baseline, current demand and infrastructure conditions. Scenario two, and I'll thank John for this one, it's uh, before network edits. This is actually something that I included last minute based on John's uh, suggestion. And, uh, but we also have a 90% increase. What will happen if the network stays as it is and we increase our demand? And scenarios three and four feature some network edits plus uh, the addition of the increase in port related traffic on the different penetration levels for autonomous trucks. And so um, ideally, we would have loved to have detailed geometry for what's planned for the study area, but uh, because that's what we need for micro simulation. And but we didn't have it. So based on many uh, simulation runs, we identified what the problem areas were, focusing on the I-710, as you can see. And we selected this red spot um, for improvement. And what we did is it's basically increased the capacity of this access points by adding a lane in most cases. Uh, in total, we added 1.6 miles of lanes to this sections. And scenario four features same RAM improvements, but with the addition of one general purpose lane along the 710, as it's highlighted in blue. Now to assess traffic improvements, we collected summary statistics, vehicle count, vehicle miles travel, vehicle hours travel, and speed in the network. Uh, for each vehicle class. And this is our baseline result. You can see we have close to 3.7 million vehicles during the 24 hours of simulation. Now, looking only at light duty vehicles and port related traffic, we saw that after the demand increase without any network edits, we saw a 20% decrease in speed uh, for passenger vehicles and a 50% decrease for poor related traffic. Now, after RAM improvements, um, while we're still below our baseline speeds, we saw a 50% improvement for passenger vehicles and a 41% improvement for port related traffic. Now, what would happen if we add a lane? We see that even without autonomous trucks, 
or still pretty close to our baseline scenario. So the question here is, do we need that additional lane or can we experience similar speeds without major investment, right? And so this uh, first graph answers that question to some degree, uh, too likely. Um, this compares the deployment our baseline scenario for deployment of autonomous vehicles, which is scenario 3A, to the deployment. So in green, we have speed gains for passenger vehicles, and in blue, speed gains for heavy duty vehicles. We see its results as expected. Of course, the most significant gain is under the 0.3 second headway. But uh, it's interesting how the 0.5, it's almost insignificant difference between the two and we can reach a speed gains of up to 30%. Now, after uh, the lane addition, we see improvements are now almost insignificant. Well, and this can be explained for, by two reasons. For one, we have more vehicles in the network because uh, our microscopic simulations uses uh, stochastic routing, so our flows are adjusted dynamically as the simulation goes. And uh, but yeah, so we have up to 1.5% increase only. Now, uh, this table, I know it's a lot of numbers, but it basically uh, provides a big breakdown of port-related speeds on freeways only by time of day. And as we can see highlighted in yellow is are the speeds of after the deployment of autonomous trucks. And we see that it's relatively uh, close to our baseline scenario already. And um, that is actually better than the speeds after the lane addition for some time periods. So we can see that uh, with only six RAM improvements in less than two miles of added lanes, we have uh, significant improvements. And this is similarly uh, looking now at only speeds of light duty vehicles. The speed gains are not as significant as I mentioned, but if we break it down by time periods during the evening peak, uh, this is, uh, we see that up to a 19% increase is reached. And uh, this is also representative of the impact of the 710 on our network because we know that Thanks to the Pure Pass program implemented by the ports, we have off peak uh, movements of flows in the study area. And now, lastly, as an interesting observation based on our countless hours of simulation, we saw that after the deployment of trucks, we observed the formation of these train like platoons in our network. This is due to lane restrictions. So under California vehicle codes, vehicles are required to drive at a maximum of 55 miles per hour. Must use you know, outer lanes or slow lanes. And so when we apply these restrictions, what happens is that other vehicle classes are stuck on one side of the platoon because how do you break that? <laughs> how do you get in and out of that? And so we found that relaxing this uh, restrictions allowed for multiple platoons to form in different lanes and that actually improved our network. In real life, maybe restricting the number of vehicles per platoon could also accomplish similar results. But at the same time, if you have multiple platoons on a restricted two, two outer lanes, you may experience similar issues. So um, this definitely suggests that uh, maybe this is something that will need to be redefined for corridors where autonomous vehicles are in operation. And to conclude this presentation, um, we saw that under the comparative adaptive cruise control operation, we can reach speed gains of up to 30%. Uh, 0.3 and 0.5 seconds were, uh, provide similar speed gains. And we can also uh, conclude that traffic improvements associated with the deployment of autonomous vehicles are equivalent to those 
associated with the addition of one lane. Uh, lane restrictions, as I mentioned, may need to be redefined. Some of the limitations of this work is our, this is a collision free model. Transmodeler doesn't model, I can model the possibility for a collision given that the vehicles are driving at this, uh, at the headway, so small as it is. But um, I guess one of the benefits of modeling a lower level of autonomy is that we still have a driver. So I think that it's a more feasible possibility for the near future. And as part of my future work, I'm still working on defining and refining this scenarios. And one of the plans is to include higher levels of autonomy, having maybe also lateral movements, and also introduce the penetration of light duty vehicles. You know, I have a high penetration of trucks, autonomous, and this of course could not be done suddenly uh, by the private sector, you know, the fleet operators, but I would envision it to be a combination of uh, a port policy provided with some type of program to fund uh, the acquisition of these vehicles. So I'll be talking about some of my uh, recent uh, like research uh, results about doing this this automated security analysis of self-driving cars and also this smart uh, traffic light system. So, um, so different from many of you, I'm actually not from the civil engineering or this transportation community. I'm actually a, a computer science uh, department a researcher and now a professor. So uh, first, just a bit about myself because I'm definitely new here. Uh, so uh, I'm, uh, like John said, I'm an assistant Professor, and then I'm um, from the CS perspe uh, that perspective, uh, and I actually just joined UC Irvine last year, which means that uh, last year I'm still in the job market. So uh, I had like um, over ten on-site interviews. So if you guys have some questions on that, those memories are still like, vivid in my mind. Uh, any questions on that are like welcomed. So. Uh, uh, so this, uh, uh, so from the title, so you know this is a, like a, a security analysis. So um, actually, Anthony just gave a very good uh, um, uh, um, a summary of his work in that space. But I'm I, I'm actually from a totally le le different perspective because I'm more on the software uh, le level, less software security, meaning that looking at the code instead of the design. So this is something uh, I'm uh, I'm um, uh, 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 good at. Uh, look at the code, and also this is something like the CS uh, expertise can jump in and, and to help with the security of the smart transportation uh, systems. So um, my yeah, basically my uh, background throughout my whole like, PhD like, period is actually uh, in the cybersecurity. So uh, I've been doing security so previously uh, in like the desktop um, the programs and software, and so it's moving a little bit onto this wireless. A network protocols, and then to the, this web, which is also a big thing uh, in computer science. Uh, but then, um, um, very recently, since these computer technologies are more and more like, moving into this physical world, so security problems uh, will, will also play a big role here. So I also start to to look at this uh, smart healthcare security, and also this uh, smart traffic light security, and so the self-driving car security, which are uh, closely related to this community. So on. Um, so basically, uh, very recently, I'm interested in this smart transportation on um, less security. And maybe this is uh, something you guys uh, like already know, but I uh, just want to uh, share my perspective. So basically, from the career science or like normal people, that part of you, there are two uh, very uh, significant advances in technology about smart transportation. So one is this connected uh, vehicle technology, particularly the connect cars, connect the infrastructures, and many of my previous panelists actually have uh, give a very very good uh, overview of what's going on there. And then also another side is this autonomous vehicles, which tries to uh, e equip cars with sensors to make them drive by, by themselves, right? So um, so why is the uh, computer science um, Researcher, I want to do something here because definitely first, very importantly, this will make me very cool, right? So, uh, self-driving cars, uh, robots, uh, uh, the future, the AI, right? These are all like the hot topics, which will 
attract people's eyes, but then more seriously. So as, as a professor, so uh, this is definitely a very, very important area, right? Because any of the security the problems in the software, uh, like implementation uh, in these kind of systems will have a direct impact on the safety of our uh, everyday life, right? And also, um, from the research pers perspective, this is also very important, right? Because, it, so especially from the software security that, that point of view, so, um, so actually, in, in these kind of le le systems, they have many, many these new uh, design components, new this uh, domain specific this software, this kind of le this this logics, which makes it really naturally very interesting for researcher to see oh what's going on there, so whether there are some new security le problems or challenges there that that we can solve and then we can contribute. So. Um, Basically, in these two two like like areas, so, so today I will be going to to basically give a pretty uh, to give a very quick like, summary about uh, what I've been doing in both of these two like, fields. So both are like the first uh, software security uh, like analysis of a certain uh, representative like design, I think, in these kind of uh, systems. So first, I will be talking about this CV side, this CV systems. So basically, in this study, uh, we perform like a first uh, software security analysis uh, by looking at the code of the intelligent uh, traffic signal system, which is um, uh, uh, ISIC for for short. So in this system, it is actually a very smart uh, idea. Uh, oh, essentially, it's just uh, uh, so, um, corresponding to what the previous uh, panelist has been talking about. This adaptive um, signal control system, not fixed, not actuated. This uh, this adaptive. And then, uh, so basically, the idea is that okay, they will be sharing this real this real time CV data to a real side uh, unit, which is the this RSU, and then um, they will passing this data to this ASIC uh, system with the hope that okay, we can have the signal control to be uh, better and more um, efficient. And then uh, we are targeting a US DOT sponsor design and and uh, implementation of this kind of uh, system which actually has been fully implemented and also tested on real roads in Anthem and also in Palo Alto, which uh, shows a very impressive, like the around like 30% reduction in the total vehicle delay on the real roads. And that's why this is a very, very big thing. People are interested. And then this is on the de uh, deployment in the New York City, and also in Tampa. So uh, then, uh, so from the security um, the point of view, so where can be those attackers, right? So here uh, we think, that, oh, okay, so one, very likely on um, on uh, um, um, this threat model is that the 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 vehicle owners themselves can actually be malicious. Let's say okay, we can because we own the car, we can do whatever we want with it. So we can deliberately control those OBUs onboard unit to send some some fake data, spoofed data to this ASIC system with the hope that okay, so so whether we can actually maliciously influence the signal the control of this ASIC system. And then uh, there are some software security analysis there uh, about this, um, particularly the ECUs, uh, the electronic control uh, units in cars. And then there are some, uh, actually these are all the previous work that shows that, okay, this, there are some way to compromise this kind of the software systems uh, um, so using a suppose physical channel or the wireless channel or by malware. So then with, attack, uh, with this attacker, so what, sh uh, what do, do you want to do with, uh, with, with this kind of systems? What are the goals, right? So one thing is that, okay, how about causing congestion? So uh, this whole system is designed for reduced congestion. How about we just revert that? And then the second thing is that, how about we actually can do something called personal gain? But it means that, okay, let's say we, uh, as attacker, we can actually minimize our own travel time. Uh, like uh, when I uh, hit like a red light, I can always turn it to the green light as, as uh, fast as possible. But of course, this is at the cost of the other vehicle's travel time. So in this particular work, we did a first step on this traffic congestion. And uh, here's the methodology. So from the software security point of view, we are doing something called this dynamic software analysis. So, um, so uh, the input for this analysis is a bunch of traffic snapshots we got from a traffic simulator. But okay, here is the VSIM uh, simulator. And on the other side, we have the code. We have the code of the ASIC system, uh, the prototype from the USDOT. So we did analysis of the attack input data flow to say, okay, if this is if this um, data is can be spoofed, so how this data is propagating in in the software uh, implementation, which is something can be automated using software analysis techniques, and then using this, we'll be concluding a bunch of these data spoofing strategies. So how can we do spoofing? 
And then in analysis, we'll be like enumerating all these possible like, options automatically, and then um, calculate the increased uh, delay um, in the intersection. And then this will be outputting this uh, spoofing options with the highest delay increase to us, as the, the, um, the testers. And then we will conclude with a bunch of this congestion creation uh, vulnerability. And then to show the real world impact, we'll also do this um, exploit uh, construction of it, basically by building a real the binary, uh, um, um, basically the code uh, implementation of this attack, and then uh, try to use this to, uh, to, to trigger this congestion creation uh, vulnerability. So uh, this, this is what we found. So basically, uh, we found lots of these vulnerabilities in the um, traffic control uh, logic. Basically, the data from even one single attack vehicle can actually greatly manipulate the traffic design, uh, the, the traffic control. So let's see this is the road, this is the attacker, and then basically the attacker is spoofing the location. And then um, here we find out that I cannot really give, give, give many details because of the time, but uh, we find that by doing this, the, the smart control algorithm can be actually fooled to uh, actually add tens of these ghost uh, vehicles. And also, war, uh, uh, war uh, can actually uh, extend the green light by, by, um, by spoofing to be a very late arriving uh, vehicle. So now, uh, I'll, I'll switch gear a little bit to the autonomous vehicle side. So I think many of you actually know this. Uh, so um, in the AV systems, uh, what these autonomous vehicles uh, uh, systems, they are using some software, like it's actually extensive use of the software to do this um, more intelligent control, like using like, many like, different like, sensors and the machine learning and sensor fusion, all these kind of things. So okay, software studies becomes really giant in this system. So how can we do software security analysis there? So. Um, so compared to traditional uh, this software analysis, which I've been doing in my PhD, so actually there's a new attack surface here, which is very unique, because it's a, it's a sensors. So um, if we think about this, this is the key input channel, uh, if not the, kind of the only channel for to make these smart control uh, decisions. And then um, since this sensor data actually coming from this um, public a channel basically is the, uh, the 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 public transportation environment. So, so naturally, there can be some potential these attackers there trying to mess up with our data. So if we, if you think from this way, this this is actually a fundamentally unavoidable attack surface for these kind of systems. So it's the first study we study something called lidar, this light based uh, detection and ranging. A reason and the reason is that if we look at this kind of this autonomous uh, vehicle platform. So this, this LiDAR sensor is something really new if we think about um, the smartphones or, or the smart home devices. So none of them are actually using this LiDAR, which is a spinning on top of a car, which looks very weird, but interesting. So um, basically, for LiDAR, what it does is that, I think most of you know, but just to give some background, so they are actually shooting some lasers to, to, this, to the surrounding uh, environment, and then uh, using the, the, the time that between the light um, being uh, sent out and also um, being received uh, to calculate the distance to the, to the obstacles. And then this can be done in a very high resolution way. For example, here this is like a 360 degree high resolution. Um, um, uh, um, so what they call it is actually a point cloud of the environment, which, is, um, which can um, maximize the chance to prevent some safety um, dangers. So on this LiDAR uh, um, device, so what can be the, these attacks, right? So um, basically here, uh, there are some known attacks trying to do this spoofing. This is called LiDAR spoofing. And then basically the idea is, okay, so since you are using this, uh, this, this light sending and, and receiving to calculate the distance, how about I just shoot some lasers, some lasers to your um, sensors and to inject some fake points? So this is something uh, I got uh, basically from a previous work uh, in this space. Um, so basically, what they have achieved is that um, so these are um, so basically the the laser is shooting from this way, and then what they can do is that they can add in some of this this um, spoofed the points to the um, to, to to the lidar uh, input, which is roughly forming a, a, like a line like there. So then the, the question is that how can we use this? Because this is like a sensor level attack, but how can we use that to affect the software decision uh, logic in the AV systems? 
So uh, we did a first security analysis of this. Uh, we target an open source uh, platform called Baidu Apollo, which is a production grid uh, a system. It's, it's already driving some buses in China. And then why it, it, it wants the open source? Because they want to be, to be the Android of the, the AV ecosystem by opening their, their platforms. But this is also very good for researchers like us because we can see a real code uh, um, in an in AV system. So it's partnering with many car companies, including a BMW, Ford, which is kind of like, like influential. So the attack want to do here is that, okay, let's say this is a car, and then we want the attacker to set like a roadside device to shoot some, some laser to, to the LiDAR, uh, to the LiDAR of this uh, autonomous driving cars. And with hope that it can actually cause it to think, oh, there's actually a fake object, uh, this object in front of it, and then trigger some undesired control decisions, uh, like an emergency brake. So, um, uh, I don't have lots of time, but this is a la like uh, like overview of, of of what we are doing here in the analysis. So first, let like, model the attack input the perturbation, like how to so so because we want to do software layer analysis, we need to somehow like, model the, the attack effect of the input. And the second, at the core of this uh, object detection process is a machine learning model. So we need to form and and also solve an optimization problem there. And then we also want to understand the security implications. So uh, after we inject these fake points, what can be done there? So what are the impact? So um, these are the results. So basically, we succeed. So uh, so definitely, I skip so lots of details, but we can definitely talk about that in detail so later. Uh, so basically, this is the uh, simulation. This is a simulator from Baidu Apollo, uh, called Sim Control. So what, what, as you can see in the red like circle, so this is uh, op this this is obstacle we injected by by shooting some uh, some laser points from uh, from our analysis. So uh, so so by doing this, we also want to see how this can impact the control of the of the software. So this is the first thing we can do to, to cause some emergency, uh, some, some uh, emergency brake. So basically, we in, when, when the car is driving, we just put an obstacle in front of it and see what's, uh, how, how the car will react. So in this case, uh, this will actually cause the car to um, dramatically decrease the speed from like 43 km per hour to like zero within one second, which is very, um, uh, it's, it's, it's actually quite a sharp uh, brake here. And another idea we have here is, which is could be more interesting, is that is that maybe we can call, do something called car freezing. So let's say a uh, autonomous driving car is actually uh, so waiting for the red light, and then uh, we can put an obstacle in front of it, and then and then even if the light turns green, it will just stop there because of this obstacle, and then we can potentially freeze this like forever, which can block the traffic flow and and, and hurt the mobility. So to conclude, so basically we initiated the first uh, research efforts to perform systematic software analysis. That's something I can contribute into the security uh, in this uh, uh, CAV systems. And uh, we discovered new attacks, the root causes, and also showed implications. And then uh, basically from my point of view, I definitely believe this, only, this is only the beginning of this CAV software security research. And then uh, by, speaking, uh, by this, like, speaking here, it's because I realized that this is a highly interdisciplinary interaction and definitely open to um, collaborations with uh, civil engineering and also uh, mechanical, uh, mechanical engineering researchers. Thanks.